Thank you so much, Dr. Edwards. I really appreciate that kind and generous introduction. Um, I am delighted to be with you here today and really honored to be delivering the annual Tagi Madarasi lecture. I hope I pronounced that right. Um, I'm sad only that I'm not literally with you in Maryland, but I'd much rather be there than just sitting in my space and looking out the window, but it's nice to be here given the circumstances. So I'm going to share my slides. Okay, hopefully you're seeing my slides. We have to be able to move this so I can see and read, yes. Okay, um, I think that uh, Kay is hopefully going to be moderating the chat for me because it's a little bit too much going on. So if there are questions, then we'll get a chance to, and I may ask you to put some things in the chat during the course of my presentation, so. Okay. As you can see, I'm going to talk about promoting healthy parent-infant relationships with families challenged by substance misuse. So here's a little bit about what I'm going to do today in very brief. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, maternal substance misuse and some of the issues that I want you to be aware of. It's really going to be a brief overview. Uh, I'm going to put some of the pieces together with substance use trauma and parenting and give you sort of a lens with how to think about um, the work that's necessary. And then I'm going to tell you about the bright intervention and uh, give you a case example. Okay. So here's a little bit about numbers. These are not all the numbers, but they're just some things that, um, okay. How's that, Kay? Is that better? Yes. Okay. I tend to get soft when I'm trying to speak up. So these are data from uh, the last you know, four or five years where we know that um, 20, about 20 million people over the age of 12 in the United States were diagnosed with a substance use disorder. Those are data from SAMHSA. And then what happens? 841,000 people die um, from a drug overdose, which is unfortunately um, a consequence of substance use disorder too often. And 70% or more of those drug overdose deaths in 2019 involved an opioid. Uh, I will say that um, there are many substances that can um, you can overdose from. Opioids are the ones that I'm most familiar with and most involved with at this point in time, given that that's some of the biggest problems that we're experiencing in my region of the country. And then we have how many women? And we've got some data on 19.5 million US women use illicit drugs in the past year. And what's also concerning is that since 2002, the rates of opioid misuse among women has doubled, and that's at a rate twice as fast as men. So something's going on in women using more substances. Um, and then the area of my concern uh, in particular is about women who are pregnant and SAMHSA has a calculus that that has gone up from 4.7% to 6.3% in pregnancy, and that's in about 2017. Here we are in the middle of the pandemic, and most of you probably know that everything is uh, stressful at this time and has had dramatic impact on mental health and substance use. And so CDC has some data out that during the pandemic, 13% of Americans reported starting or increasing substance use to cope with stress. <laughs> and that has led to an 18% increase in overdoses. Well, those are just some of the numbers that I, are very sobering to really understand that this problem has gotten actually quite a bit worse during the pandemic. So here we see that the rate of overdose, overdose deaths have gone up for mothers. And we're also seeing that opioid use disorder has gone up more than four times for pregnant women. Okay, these are very, very concerning statistics. And with the pregnant women come infants and who are born 
opioid exposed. And we now the term is neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome. You may have heard the term NAS before. You may have heard the term babies aren't really talked about as being born addicted. We tend to not talk about it in that way. And the opioid withdrawal syndrome is really what they are experiencing. And we've seen dramatic increase in that over the last um, uh, 15 years. We also know that there's racial disparities in the access to treatment for substance use disorders. And that's true from what I understand across the country. You may know better about your state and region, but that um, the opioid, it, it, and since the time in the last 10 or 12 years that I've been working in this area, there's been some thinking that there was less opioid use, particularly in the black community. And there were a lot of different reasons given for that. And more recently, I think people are recognizing that there's um, less, potentially less reporting, and but not less problem. And what we are seeing is that there's um, insufficient um, treatment programs for people of color, and that uh, Black people were less likely to receive a particular treatment that is now almost standard in EDs people coming in with opioid-related overdoses, that buprenorphine is made available quite readily. And yet, Black people were less likely to receive that treatment within 30 days of an overdose. Very concerning. And in terms of women, um, there are fewer women of color in substance use treatment programs. And some of this, the thinking, is that there's a lot of history of stigma for Black women during the crack epidemic and what that was made to be, that it was an epidemic among Black women, for sure, and that there was, has been and continues to be a fear of imprisonment and losing, losing child custody. And again, that has happened for many Black women and for many women in general. And um, women of color, we know from the statistics, and this is true all over the country, are more likely to be reported to child welfare. And so although women with substance use disorder are reported to child welfare, and I'll give you a little bit more of the data on that, we know that women of color are even more likely to be reported to child welfare. Some of the reasons why people might not engage in treatment. Um, we also have seen that there's a dearth of treatment programs for pregnant women. And so white women are filling up the beds essentially, and that makes less treatment programs available for other women. And we have a study that's going on in Boston through Boston Medical Center right now to really understand what's happening for women of color. And some of the early findings are showing that stigma and poor self-worth associated with substance use disorders contribute to not seeking care. So again, we see that for many women, but we're seeing it in a heightened way for women of color. And there's also a cultural specificity in the belief that family is sufficient to address problems. And so a less of a likelihood to go out and tell somebody about what's going on. And also we're not, we're seeing the staff of some of these programs not representing the communities that they're trying to serve. And so that is being addressed uh, at Boston Medical Center in a number of different ways. And if you're interested in that, I can tell you about that. So USA Today, not necessarily, I'll be honest, one of my favorite newspapers, but there is a, um, this is a, from a number of years ago, but I think the idea that um, this is an epidemic and of opioid use and these babies are struggling and um, I'm all about concern for the babies, but the level of um, uh, concern here is very blaming. So you can hear or read, and I'll read just briefly, uh, this article leads with, when newborn babies begin to withdraw from powerful drugs, they shriek at a high telltale pitch, cut off from the substances they ingested through their mothers, they convulse, projectile vomit, rise from skin scorching diarrhea. So it's a very vivid and a very alarmist picture that is being presented to the public. What we know about neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome is that it is due to in utero opioid exposure and that it does affect um, between six and 20 newborns per thousand. There's a lot of different reasons why some uh, newborns experience this and some don't. Um, there was a scale called the Finnegan that has been used uh, typically, and these are the kinds of things that the children get rated on. So it might be diarrhea, excessive high-pitched crying, fever, poor feeding, irritability, um, 
sleep problems, seizures, et cetera. It's a big long list, right? So that is certainly concerning and I don't wanna minimize it at all. But there's been an interesting uh, movement in the past, I wanna say five years or so called Eat Sleep Console. Some of you that um, work in NICUs will know about this and that it has been moving around the country and that um, typically what was happening in the past with substance exposed newborns is that the uh, baby was scored on the Finnegan and with a score of over eight, the infant was moved to a special care nursery and the opioids were titrated until the score decreased. And so there was an average stay about two to three weeks. I think in our hospital, it was certainly um, looking more like three weeks and actually even more. Uh, there's a movement developed by folks in a number of different hospitals, Boston University, including them, Yale, I think Dartmouth, and to really look at a function-based tool to replace the Finnegan and to optimize the mother's relationship with the infant in order to care and comfort the baby. And so with that optimization, and there was a, there's a whole protocol involved, um, methadone was used when indicated, but much less methadone was used for these babies. And the decrease in pharmacological treatment was truly amazing. And the decrease in hospital stays over just about a year of use. And I can't, you know, the data keeps changing, but, you know, we went from multiple weeks average to something like seven or eight days. And so these babies, they might have gone home on some methadone that had to be administered by the mother, but they were staying in the hospital less and they were rooming in with their mothers and having much more skin to skin contact, et cetera. The things that we typically know is going to be uh, things that are going to be helpful for babies. And so I would, I'm, I'm setting the stage here to say that from the get go, an attachment based approach is going to make a difference for all babies, but certainly babies who are exposed in utero to substances and opioids. So again, another, this is from the Boston Globe, another, you know, um, again, opioid addic opioid addiction. And this was another, you can probably see, Maya Barry was born with opioids already coursing through her tiny veins. And so again, sort of an alarmist um, and really blaming of the mothers. And so what we know about pregnancy for women with substance use disorder is that it's a huge motivator for treatment. And so it's, a, it's an optimal time for women to engage in treatment. And uh, if there are services available, women will most often take advantage of them. Um, so here we have a heightened public concern about these newborns. And on the good side, that can lead to new programs for mothers and infants, right? And uh, it can also lead to increased shame and guilt for the mother. So if you are labeled in this way, and if you read these kinds of articles, and there was a time a few years ago when we were seeing these, uh, I felt like every week there was another article and we had some really painful and sad um, situations that happen in our region. And I know they're from all around the country. Um, so a mom who is struggling with substance use disorder and finds herself pregnant um, is going to experience lots of shame and guilt, and that's gonna make it difficult to engage somebody in treatment. These are some words from moms who participated in some of my studies in terms of talking about the shame and guilt that they experience. So here's a mom who says, I got pregnant with my second son when I was in the grips of my disease, I couldn't stop. I thought I was the only woman on the face of this earth scumbag enough to use while pregnant. I didn't know who to tell. I thought if I told somebody I'd be walking around with like the letter A on my chest. Definitely a disincentive to go for treatment. It was terrible to see my baby suffer from my actions from you know what I put him through. It was terrible to see the effects and still suffer and you know the consequences of that disease. Again, very, very um, guilty about it and really having a difficult time being able to tell. This is um, also some quotes about the feeling of judgment. I always felt like if I was to tell a doctor or tell somebody that I'd be so judged and looked at like a piece of crap for having a newborn and having a drug addiction. That says it all. Uh, another mom had an experience when she was in the hospital. Uh, I just had nurses constantly judging me. I had one come in and say, this is her saying, oh, you poor baby, saying to the baby, that's awful that you have to detox like this in front of me. And she felt that the nurse was doing that to make her feel badly that it was aimed at her. Um, Goodmacher Institute 
uh, keeps track of state policies regarding pregnancy and substance misuse. And I thought I'd just give you some of the highlights because we are as a country kind of all over the place. Um, so 23 states and the District of Columbia consider substance use during pregnancy to be child abuse under child welfare statutes and three considerate grounds for civil commitment. Okay, so that's just a clear statement. 25 states in the District of Columbia require healthcare professionals to report suspected prenatal drug use. This is not true in Maryland. Um, it is true in Massachusetts. Um, and eight states require them to test for prenatal drug exposure if they suspect drug use. So when we're talking about prenatally here, we're not, the baby's not born yet. Um, 19 states have either created or funded drug treatment programs specifically tar targeted to pregnant women. Maryland does this, and this is what we like to see because there's a great need. And 17 states and the District of Columbia provide pregnant women with priority access. Maryland does not provide that. Massachusetts doesn't either. 10 states prohibit publicly funded drug treatment programs from discriminating against pregnant women. I, I want to draw attention to that because it's like I would hope that that would be 50 states. But there are many pregnant women who can will not get accepted into drug treatment programs. So they want to be, but the program, for whatever reason, feels like they can't, you know, they can't service the woman. And so there's only 10 states that actually block that. Um, there are um, federal child abuse prevention funds. And in order to receive these funds, a state must require healthcare providers to notify Child Protective Services when the provider cares for an infant affected by illegal substance use. And this most often means that there's going to be a tox screen done when the baby's born. And if the um, baby tests positive for a medication for addiction treatment, so methadone, buprenorphine, and possible other medications, then um, many states require, most states require, that child abuse reports be um, filed. Now, this has been moving and changing a little bit. Um, one of our local hospitals just made a decision that if a mom is on methadone, we have mothers who were on methadone for five years, and they were getting child abuse reports filed on them when they had been stable and they were on their medication. Um, so it's as if you were filing, uh, you know, a child abuse report on the mother who's taking insulin. So this is something that we're working with, but it varies from state to state and from hospital to hospital. Okay, um, so that gives you some of the background, a little bit the lay of the land. Um, and now we're going to move into some of the other things that are important to understand in order to help parents with substance use disorders and their young children. So I, know, I realize I'm talking to a group of uh, many medical doctors here, so this is going to be a very, very uh, cursory mention of drugs and the way they affect the brain. Um, there's a lot of ways that drugs affect the brain, but I always want to lift it up, particularly for people who are non-medical providers, to make sure they understand that there is um, brain involvement in the use of drugs. And if one uses drugs for a long time, there's, you know, longer changes. So common drugs of addiction impact the brain in multiple areas, but I'm talking today about the do dopamine circuitry and the pleasure um, reward kinds of interactions that are experienced. And many people in the substance use field talk about the brain being hijacked by these um, drugs. And for women who are parenting young children, if their um, dopamine receptors have been used to heroin or other opioids, and the, the pleasures that are getting reinforced are at that high, um, that peak of what opioids uh, provide and what dopamine reinforces, you could imagine that there would be difficulty experiencing pleasure in some smaller things, right? So you can see that in the image here that something like food, chocolate, I would say, it you know the dopamine receptors, things are getting activated. But if you look, this this uh, image talks about cocaine. Cocaine is you know the dopamine transporters and receptors, they're, they're happening quite a bit more. And this is true as well with opioids. So if you're experiencing the kinds of things that one experiences in the pleasure of early parenting, which might be physical contact with your baby, the beginning emotional connections, um, you know, just the simple joys of 
looking into a child's eyes, watching the first smiles, those are literally not providing the same types of pleasures that they would for a non-substance uh, using mother. So that's really important. And I think those of us who are interveners and running programs and working with families really need to understand that there's a, a, a changes that have happened for these moms and that to be able to provide interventions that are going to understand that and understand the process of substance misuse. And so the other piece that's important here is that when we have um, pleasure in the small things that we get from parenting very young children, um, it helps us tolerate the challenges of parenting, right? So when you have this terrific bond with your baby um, at 3 a.m. when they're crying for an hour, you are able to tolerate and remember a little bit more about the good things that are happening um, in your relationship with them. But again, because of some of the brain changes and because of the limitations of having that bond with your baby, uh, the ability to tolerate um, crying and the intense needs of infants is compromised. This is just another um, image about the changes in neural circuitry and how it can affect caregiving. Um, Helena Rutherford and Linda Mays at, at Yale have done a lot of work in this area. And if you're interested, I would look up um, Helena Rutherford's work because she's doing incredible studies. And in what I just said in terms of the dysregulation and the stress and reward neural circuits. And so what does that mean? Some of it may mean that these moms have a difficulty or delay in discerning the infant cues. And there have she has done studies to show that both faces and sounds, there's a delayed reaction. Uh, and so mothers who have a substance use disorder or are being treated for a substance use disorder um, have been shown to not respond in the same ways than a mother without a substance use disorder. And if you can take this and imagine what that would do in terms of parental caregiving behavior and infant attachment formation. So a baby learns that if they cry, they get a response from their parent, they get soothed. That begins the sort of co-regulation process and the attachment process. If a baby who cries does not get responded to, um, that infant might begin to try and change the cues that they're offering to a parent. And so they may begin to, at a very early age, not cry um, because they're not get, you know, eventually not getting reinforced for getting a connection there. And that begins a process of, um, of moving away from a potential attachment with a parent and sort of what that infant internalizes about what a distress might mean as they grow and uh, develop and mature into their own relationships. So you can begin to imagine how that miscuing that the baby might do uh, is going to affect attachment in the long run. Okay, so what about trauma? Uh, those of you that work in the substance use field know that um, most people with substance use disorders have a history of trauma. That's certainly true for the more than 200 women that I've had contact with in my studies. And so just in we're taking this separate from substance use disorder, that cumulative maternal trauma exposure is already a significant predictor of trauma treatment. And those things might include punitive um, parenting, um, aggression, more physical discipline. So those are things that have been shown for mothers who have trauma histories. And there are um, multiple pathways to how people behave. And that's also thinking about risk and protective factors. I wanna highlight here emotion regulation because emotion regulation is crucial in early parenting. I think it's crucial um, all the time. And, but it is compromised when a person has a trauma history and it is also compromised when a person has a substance use disorder. It's just a very, little bit about trauma and addiction. And if you have a, you know, I'm starting over here, although you can kind of start almost anywhere in this circle, but trauma can lead to emotional upheaval. That's a very simplistic way of putting it, but that is what it does. And for many people, um, they might use substances in order to, you know, calm themselves in order to regulate. Um, and that use of substances, it 
leads to a decreased ability to learn new skills and to process traumatic material, right? So that difficulty in processing traumatic material can lead to continued substance use because that's the only thing that's going to actually um, calm a person or enable them to regulate. And there you go, right? And what happens with the lifestyle that often is um, a part of having substance use disorder is trauma comes along with the lifestyle as well. Um, for many people, it can lead to homelessness. It can lead to um, interpersonal violence. It can lead to lots of other things which come along with trauma. So when we do trauma histories with the women who are in our program, we're learning about childhood trauma and we're learning about what might have led to the substance use to begin with. But then we're hearing about trauma in the adult life and often involving interpersonal violence. So these kinds of things, um, most pregnancies are unplanned and there is often a history of childhood trauma and I mentioned current trauma, life stressors, a history of poor attachment relationships for the parent themselves, um, and as you know, co-occurring disorders, very common. So let's put together the pieces. Okay, I've mentioned a lot of different things here, but I wanna keep these things in mind as you're listening. So for the baby, we have the in utero exposure, right? So there's quite a range of what it means to be exposed in utero to substances. And the baby is at increased risk, but I wanna be clear that not all babies have, um, well, I have, still have NAS up here, not all babies have neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome, um, not all babies have regulation problems, but there is a greater risk and there's a greater risk for having developmental problems from the in utero exposure. But what we do know is that the caregiving environment that many of these babies are born into are equally or more important in how the child grows, right? So if a baby is exposed in utero and then comes into an environment which is supportive and the mom has gotten treatment and you know things are going much better, then the trajectory is very positive um, compared to an environment where um, the mom hasn't gotten treatment and there's difficulty with emotion regulation. Uh, these are things that have been found in moms with substance use disorder, a lot of difficulty with responsiveness, emotional involvement. Um, we see a lot of intrusiveness with the babies, uh, sometimes withdrawal and difficulty in reciprocity and contingency. The moms might misread their babies and this is partly because of the brain involvement that I described earlier. It's partly because of what kind of parenting they receive themselves. And it's partly because we know with uh, recovery that relapse is often a part of recovery. And so there's a process that's happening in order to um, ma maintain sobriety. Child welfare is almost always involved. And um, we know in the child welfare population, particularly with infants and young children, and this varies from state to state, but it's about a third to two thirds of children involved with child welfare have parents who are uh, have a substance use disorder. And that um, we've seen many, many more children who uh, have uh, neonatal opioid withdrawal syndrome and that has coincided with the increase in opioid misuse and with seeing an increase in these children in the child welfare system. Um, and I, I said a little bit about this already, but so we've got mothers and fathers who come into the parenting role without an experience of secure attachment. So if you anticipate um, in a typical population, a community sample that you'd have 65 to 70% of people securely attached, um, we have in our studies, people are more like 35% securely attached. Um, so there's challenges there for sure about how they're coming into the parenting experience and so from their own histories. So these are lots of different um, issues that impact the young child and the parent-child dyad. I'm, I'm quoting here a colleague, a Finnish colleague, Mar Marjuka Penulo, and the reason why I have her quote up here and why I maintain it is because this is really about the relationship. So I've shared with you about what the parent brings to the equation. I've shared with you about what the baby brings to the equation. There's systems issues involved, but at 
it, it's important as interveners to think about what's happening in the relationship. And Mariuka says well here that the substance exposed mother and child are difficult regulatory partners for each other. So the exposed infant often has an impaired ability to regulate his or her own states and needs more parental help. And at the same time, I've told you enough, the mother usually has a reduced capacity to read the child's signals for lots of different reasons. And so the combination is, is problematic and it can lead to some negative cycles that culminate in either withdrawal or intrusiveness and often a, a, a risk for child maltreatment. So I, I caution us to remember again, I think I've said this, but I, I like to highlight it, that in utero exposure is one cause of poor outcomes for children. Okay, so it doesn't mean that because the child was exposed in utero that that's predictive really of anything. We just don't know. We have to watch that child. Um, there is a complex interplay of relationships, and I've said that already. Caregiving practices, that's where we come in because we can intervene if we're intervening um, post-birth. Uh, but still, the, um, the negative outcomes for a child can be great, and they do include um, higher incidence of depression and impulsivity, self-destructive behaviors, impaired cognitive social emotional development. So the necessity to intervene early is great. It's, it's great. Um, okay, so just to remember, this is one of our moms who participated in our program, it's really, really important to remember that most mothers in recovery from substance use disorders care about their children. They all want to be good mothers. I cannot tell you how every single woman that I've talked to who have been in one of our programs and one of my studies, they all want to be good mothers. Caregiving varies widely, even for women with substance use disorder. There's not one typical, you know, I presented data here, but it's really about each particular woman, and we see a range in the women that are in our projects and our studies. But at the same time, um, states and, you know, hospitals make their own decisions, and substance use histories become um, a, a greater, you're at greater risk for losing custody of your child. And so no you know, you can understand why women would hide, right? Because they're fearful of losing their child. So it's something to just, again, things to keep in mind. I mentioned emotion regulation before, and I wanna come back to it because it's such an important piece of early attachment. And it's so crucial in the interventions that we offer early in life. Um, we know that having a parent who is able to regulate their emotional states is necessary for sensitive parenting and to promote optimal infant attachment. Um, any kinds of early experiences that support the mother-infant bond, and I would say this is true of fathers as well, but for a mother, it would be things like breastfeeding or just close physical contact. These types of early bonding experiences have the potential to upregulate neural networks, which support a mother's interpreting infant cues. And that in turn, reinforces a regulated emotional response. So the mother can really, now we know that women with serious substance use disorders are compromised in that way, but we know from what I shared with you about Eat Sleep Console, that those connections with their babies from early on can actually make a difference both for the baby and for them in being able to, starting to activate the neural circuitry to get them feeling that pleasure, right? So to be able to um, have the brain heal essentially and to, to pull it back into the relationship with the child. Um, these early relationships we know shape children's ability to regulate emotion. And we also know, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this later, parents with higher reflective functioning, the ability to reflect on um, behaviors and emotional states, they're better able to regulate their own emotions. The big challenge here is emotion dysregulation is a key component of substance use disorders, right? So this is a hallmark of substance use disorders. Again, if those of you who are in the field know that emotion regulation is extremely difficult, some people postulate that difficulty with emotion regulation is what draws people to substances, and then the continued use of substances compromises emotion regulation. So it's a it's a central part of treatment in for people with SUDs. So where does that leave us in terms of trying to make a difference for these parents and 
um, young children. Oftentimes, if you're in a services plan for child welfare, there'll be a parenting class check. And what unfortunately, and I'm not, this is not being dismissive of many parenting curricula that are out there. I think some of them are very good, but for mothers who are compromised in the way that I've been describing to you for the last bit of time, that we don't see that it dem those types of classes, um, they don't demonstrate changes in parent-child interactions or in child development. And part of the reason why we think that is, is because it assumes that parents can tolerate emotional stress. We know that people with substance use disorder have difficulties with that, and that they experience parenting as rewarding. And again, we know that um, in the ideal they do, but it's really, it has to be built and developed. And um, they don't address what we think of as the internal men mental representations for the parent, essentially what they're bringing into the parenting um, relationship from way from where they were parented themselves. I think I need to have a sip of water here. Okay. So I'm not alone. Nancy Sookman was a colleague of mine at Yale who developed an intervention called Mothering from the Inside Out. And she has um, and others have talked about relational approaches. And these relational approaches are derived from mental health. They're attachment based. They emphasize affect and the relationship between a parent and child. And they help parents invest in their child rather than substances. That's something that's really important. If you, I have had people tell me that heroin is the love of their life. And if you feel that heroin is the love of your life, it's really hard to have feel like that child is the love of your life, which is what many parents uh, feel when they first see their child and what you want to feel like that experience of falling in love with your child. Um, there are a host now, or at least three or four of parenting interventions out there that focus on building reflective function with parents who have substance use disorder. For those of you that have not heard the term parental reflective functioning in a very brief way, this refers to the ability to reflect on and understand the mental state of yourself, of your own mental state and one's child. Okay, so it's really about, and particularly with very, very young children, being able to imagine and think about what your child might be feeling. So we've had moms who have a three-month-old baby say to us that the baby is crying because she knows that I'm a bad mother. And, um, you know, all these terrible things that I did to her. And so in an intervention to help build reflective functioning, uh, the intervener might explore that a little bit with the mother and wonder about where that comes from and also share a little bit of developmental guidance about what might happen for a three month old when they're crying. Right? So it's a both it's a in vivo, real life, here you are with a mother and a baby who's crying and you're thinking about what the mother is thinking and what's getting triggered for her. And you're also helping the mother imagine what might really be happening for that baby as opposed to a significant misattribution. We do know in many studies that better parental reflective functioning can mediate the negative effects of substance misuse and trauma and mental health challenges on caregiving relationships. And now there's a, a increasingly robust body of literature about this. Okay, how am I doing? Close, close. Okay, um, we have an intervention that we've been working on, we I say, because it's all those people listed at the bottom of your screen um, through SAMHSA and HRSA. Uh, begin doing work in residential treatment programs, in opioid treatment programs, in uh, prenatal clinic to engage uh, parents in what is called the BRIGHT intervention, building resilience through intervention, growing healthier together. This is a little bit about the intervention. I'm going to tell you more about it, but essentially we have the mom and the baby here um, and the kinds of things that are affecting them are going to be like parental substance misuse, mental health issues, the challenges in parenting, we have a lot of risk of child maltreatment and we're concerned about the infant's development. Bright comes in and hopefully does these things and I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about them but in general, um, promoting developmental play, developmental guidance, supporting a parent's protective behavior, translating the child's feelings and actions as I just described, providing emotional support, encouraging emotion regulation, reflective functioning, and also providing the concrete assistance that's so necessary for um, 
these women in their lives. And we have lofty goals, oops, lofty goals here is that we want to improve lots of things, including a parent-child relationship, the mother's mental health, and, um, you know, help the child to have a good trajectory of social emotional development. So we, we rely heavily on um, the principles in child parent psychotherapy, although we don't do exactly the same work, um, partly because of how our, where we enter the relationship. Um, we also rely heavily, as I shared a moment ago, on best mental health practices for parents in recovery. So that means that interveners who are using the Bright Intervention are gonna know a lot about infant mental health uh, they may be trained in child parent psychotherapy, maybe not, but they also know a lot about substance use and about substance use treatment. And so that's where we had to think about how do we need to adapt this treatment? What if we're in residential treatment? What if we're in an opioid treatment program? How long do we have to work with a mom, et cetera? And then the, the big piece here that I've mentioned a few times is to focus on emotion regulation, which is... Um, is a part of lots of good infant mental health interventions and also to build on reflective functioning because that's where we see um, the most promise for helping these mothers and babies. These are again some of the core concepts in what we do in Bright and there's lots of shared experience of pleasure and connection. Uh, we want to just a dyadic work, we want to explore the relationship um, sometimes it might be a conversation with the mother. If you have a three-month-old, you can have a conversation. The intervention goes from birth to five. So, you know, obviously what you're going to be in conversation with the mother about a three-month-old versus a four-year-old are going to be a little bit different. But there's a, the work is dyadic. You're thinking about the past, we need with the present. Again, regulation of affect, a lot of co-regulation, and building parental reflective functioning. I think I've said these things numerous times now. And here's a little bit of a digging down into what clinicians typically do. So it's a very, it's a, we have guidelines for the Bright Intervention, but it is flexible as well. So it's not a curriculum. We're able to provide emotional support and concrete assistance. And there's a tremendous amount of uh, recovery support, which is necessary. It is not a substance use treatment um, in and of itself. So we've always worked in tandem with substance use treatment um, because we believe that there's a lot that's necessary that cannot be covered. It, it really is a therapeutic parenting intervention. And so there's lots of mother, baby, mother, young child work. Uh, the work in our current um, randomized trial begins in pregnancy. So it's already beginning to think about the child during pregnancy. And uh, it is overall using a lot of reflection. As you can imagine, this is a, a tough intervention and reflective supervision as an all good infant mental health practice is essential because the, the moms have lived through a lot and they're trying, they're trying really hard to, to, to do the work that they need to do to keep their children and to do well by their children, but it's hard work. It's hard work for the clinicians. Okay, I think this is where, just a reminder to stop recording because I'm going to start talking about some. We do have time for questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Paris. Um, there, there was an earlier question about what would the work look like when you're working with preschoolers? Um, so I'm going to stop sharing the screen. So although this baby's adorable. OK. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, you know, the work looks quite similar, as you can see. So if you can imagine yourself in the room with, um, the, you know, with Johnny when he was a toddler, it's going to be different. There's going to be like any parent-child work at that point in time. Um, there would be some individual work with the parent, and there would be work that happens with the parent and the child. I think the, the piece here that is somewhat different from the point of entry is the parent. The child is not necessarily, the parent is not necessarily reporting on difficult behaviors, although we do see that the children do have many difficult behaviors. But, um, you know, the work looks sort of a lot the same. I mean, I can go into a lot of different detail about it, but it's good parent-child work, which involves both dyadic sessions and individual sessions with the parent, not necessarily individual sessions with the child. Mm -hmm. 
I think for our team, that's an important distinction where we um, in the child clinic and the CIS clinic would get referrals, you know, because there's a concern about the child and their development. Um, so this is kind of a, a nice companion, a way for infant mental health people to collaborate with uh, recovery centers and substance use uh, programs. Yeah, it's, it's, it is a distinction, Kay, because um, the point of entry is the parent and the parent-child relationship. And so many, many parents um, have a difficult time. If not, you know, they're not necessarily coming in thinking they've caused trauma to their child. That's mm -hmm. a place that they can get to later on when they may experience guilt, they may experience shame, but to be able to come right out you know, we have on our um, trauma exposure questionnaire, we always ask whether the child has um, was exposed to people using substances. And we know that all of these children have been exposed to people using substances, but we get about 40 to 50% of the moms acknowledging that. Mm -hmm. um, because many of the moms say, well, he was in another room. He didn't hear me. He was in the back seat of the car. I was in the front seat of the car. And, and it's hard to it's hard to really take in that while they were under the influence, they were with their children and um, that that had an impact on them. So that's part of the work. So it's a little bit of a different entry in that way. Thank you. I want to note that a lot of the folks that uh, I couldn't read all the comments when you invited people to write in a chat, but there were so many folks that were able to and and so graciously, you know, empathize with the mom and focused on her strengths in that moment, too. Yes. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Can you save the chat, Kay, so that I can at the end of this? I think I can. Okay. Other uh, questions or comments? I think I had more of a comment. This is Kim Gordon. Uh, so you just reminded me why I like infant mental health. <laughs> I usually do a lot of adolescent psychiatry, but this was just a wonderful reflection of prevention, early, early prevention. And so I had the pleasure of working for like nurse family partners in Louisiana, and they had a number of uh, new mother, first time mothers who refer with substance use uh, issues. Uh, one of the uh, I think one of the things that was very interesting in this program is that it really had nurses to engage with first time mothers and teach circle of security and those type of things. Uh, what do you see as a barrier to like early in you know, intervention for substance use uh, for women who are engaging with more like the OBGYN side than maybe uh, mental health in terms of getting those referrals in, because I, I feel like if they get in early, they get a lot of support and they grow. And I, and I had the pleasure of seeing some of them change their practices, even with their older children or, you know, other children. Uh, so it definitely has an impact for the whole family, but it was hard to get those referrals in. Yes. Yeah. Um, good question. This is a, you know, very challenging. I think that, um, embedding so we have a prenatal clinic for women with substance use disorder right that's where we're recruiting right now and embedding an infant mental health person um, in that clinic at, and it, to be routine as part of what the work is and to be able to routinely help the mom begin honestly the attachment process and to think about the, her recovery and her relationship with the child and to begin that process during pregnancy is really the time to start it. Um, ideally, if you if you go afterwards, we have a clinic for kids who are substance exposed. So these kids all go to a pediatric clinic. That's another mm -hmm. place where if you embed an infant mental health person there, so it becomes part of the treatment team in the best way we know about integrated care, mm -hmm. right? And so same thing with early intervention part C, right? If you have somebody who's trained in this way, because many of these moms are not going to come to a mental health or something like that to say, you know, I use substances and therefore my child has, you know what I mean? That it's not the way that the presentation is not going to happen that way. It has to be um, in partnership also in substance use treatment programs, right? Having an infant mental health person there. So these are just some of the ways that, I, that we've done it and have been um, successful. 
and it's at the same time it remains challenging remains challenging and the old adage start where the in this case start where the mother is at right mm -hmm. start with what her concerns are I, I will take over with questions but you had a really great slide with the policies uh, and laws that have affected uh, substance use disorders uh, and uh, in particularly women uh, with children uh, is there any consultation for those entities that engage with you know these mothers uh, who have substance use disorders, but also may be in jeopardy of uh, having their children removed uh, to really educate them about the emotional regulatory issues that play? Because I've had a number of parents who I've worked with who unfortunately did lose their children or lose one or two, which is a bunch in my mind, uh, just because the officials who were dealing with their legal issues didn't quite understand how complicated this is. So I'm wondering that with this program you have, if there's some type of consultation there. Um, the, this is a long answer, but uh, as this is a Sorry. big policy, no good question. Um, we have worked in our state for many years with our you know, Child Protective Services and such the point that we now have um, sort of substance use experts embedded within child welfare. So it's all about you know the matching and the pairing of the different um, systems that we work in, right? Because mental health and substance use are very siloed, and infant mental health is siloed, and then the judicial system, where many of these parents have to go through. So embedding people who have the knowledge to pull these pieces together, you know, that's why I had a slide that was like, uh, you know, putting the pieces together, because we have to, those of us that are working in this space have to put all those people pieces together in order to educate the judges and the lawyers and the, you know, child welfare workers and on attachment. So, yes, the answer is we try. <laughs> and we try. And I can tell you some very painful stories that happened during the pandemic that made me feel like you know, I, I was extremely distressed with how many parents had their kids removed. Um, and it's not, you can't really do televisits with a six week old. You know, right. that was very, very painful. So we breathe and then hopefully uh, we keep moving on. So thank you for that question. Yeah, thank you for that question. And we're gonna be trying here too. And so Ruth has been a great mentor and her work has really helped us get one grant through our VOCA grant, uh, the Victim of Crime Assistance Department of Justice grant. So we're going to, her, her knowledge and her research has been fundamental. So we're going to keep it going. One more question, Ruth. Have you, has this uh, work uh, been done with dads? Good question. Um, so I will say that partly because of where we've worked, you know, then there's been mostly moms. However, in our first bright grant that was funded by SAMHSA, we worked in, um, residential treatment and of the eight residential treatment programs in Massachusetts, one of them has fathers in it. And Great. so um, I have some wonderful video footage about a dad talking about the intervention and it was, it, it is certainly um, feasible and workable and dads have different ways of parenting, but mm -hmm. um, the answer is yes and, and but because we mm -hmm. haven't had that many dads involved. Great. Well, I want to thank um, Dr. Ruth Paris uh, for her wonderful presentation, for being a wonderful mentor to me, and for her groundbreaking research, and for being our first uh, social work professor to deliver the Tagi Matarasi uh, Memorial Lecture. And uh, yesterday was the close of National Social Work Month, so it all seemed incredibly appropriate. And we're very grateful to have all of you join us. And if you can stay with us for a couple minutes, we're gonna um, shift to our Tagi Matarasi celebration. And I'm gonna pass it off to Carol while I bring up the slides. Oh, Andre, could you make me the presenter? Oh, there we go. Yes, I just did. Thank you. I add my gratitude, Dr. Paris, to your presentation. It was really, not only informative, but very hopeful about what the direction we could go. I'm here to tell you just a little bit about Tagi Madaresi and Alma Tragali. Tagi was a force of nature. 
By his own report, he started his workday at 5 a.m. in the morning in his University of Maryland Baltimore office, writing one of his five novels that he published, authored in, per, in, um, trans, in Persian and translated later. By 7 a.m., he was usually seeing a psychoanalytic adult patient. And yes, he did have a black leather couch in his office. <laughs> When I came in to start my clinical day about eight in the morning, this man had already been working for at least three hours. With this fervor and passion and against all odds, he was determined to establish a center to understand, teach, and serve the mental health needs of young children and their families. Hence, the Center for Infant Study was established in the 1982-83 timeframe. Alma, was a kind and compassionate businesswoman who was miraculously able to keep the center financially afloat in spite of many years of uncertainty. My favorite memory of Alma, you'll see on the bottom left corner, is how she nurtured the staff in so many ways. She loved cooking and would often bring her wonderful Italian dishes and salads in for our annual Center for Infant Study holiday party for the children and families. There was so much joy and laughter among those of us lucky enough to work with her in the early Center for Infant Studies infinitesimal kitchen um, <laughs> that it was just a, tr a thrill <laughs> to be on the kitchen team. In her last few months in Baltimore, she continued to regularly bring in her homemade cake creations for our celebrations of birthdays and, and um, si significant transitions, and it was always carried in in her signature Tupperware cake carrier. <laughs> My most tender memory of Toggy, and this is how I remember him and his hat and glasses on, um, was that in his uh, the last few months, he continued coming into his office every day, even after he stepped down as being director. It was such a delight to learn something new at that point in my long relationship of um, about 13 years working with him. He loved homegrown flowers. And in those last few months prior to his death, we were able to share some special moments sniffing and admiring the daffodils and the pennies arrangements from our yards that brightened the Center for Infant Study space. Toggy and Alma's vision for the needs of young children and family and Toggy's commitment to his attachment and trauma-focused lens that he brought um, and informed the center's training and research efforts that continues to this day, 39 years later. But it's their passion and their joy of the work that remains the heart and soul of the Center for Infant Study. Thank you, Carol. It is my great pleasure today to um, offer the Alma Trockley Award for Excellence in Advocating for the Mental Health Needs of Young Children and Their Families to the family of Crystal Hardy Flowers uh, in her memory uh, of her pioneering work in early childhood. Um, Crystal was, I was lucky enough to know Crystal when she was uh, just starting her social work career. She was a graduate student at Howard University and came to Kennedy Krieger for her internship. And we worked alongside each other for about 20 years. Um, first, uh, next, she went to the Ch Baltimore Child Advocacy Center. She's a, a significant trauma expert and advocate for, for children in our community. And then she made a big, um, brave shift in her social work career to open Little Flowers Early Childhood Development Center, um, Early Childhood and Development Center in Sandtown, Winchester. Um, I share this uh, picture of a daffodil and the quote from Amanda Gorman's amazing inaugural um, poem, there's always light, even if only we are brave enough to see it, if only we are brave enough to be it. 
And that really captures, for me, the spirit of Crystal as a pioneering early childhood expert and a, a really innovative and committed social worker who cared deeply about children, families, and the communities that surrounded them. She, um, she testified at Congress uh, to uh, try to end, put an end to expelling um, children from pre-K and early care education programs, which disproportionately affect um, particularly boys of color in West Baltimore. She uh, created an annual cotillion for the young kids and um, that joined her program. And you can see this beautiful picture of one of the cotillions. Um, she kept her uh, little flowers open throughout the pandemic. Uh, Sandtown Winchester families that use that service uh, do not often, many of them do not have the privilege to work virtually or work from home. And she kept uh, that, that essential service uh, going during this uh, very difficult time. We were lucky enough to be one of her partners in her vision to create a trauma-informed um, attachment-based uh, center, uh, which is a vital service for that community. I'm going to pass it over to uh, Shanique and uh, Jasmine Hardy, who is uh, Crystal's niece and now the director of the center. Hi. Um, my name is Shanique Rogers. I am a mental health consultant with um, University of Maryland Center for Infant Studies. I met, um, I had the pleasure of working with Ms. Flowers. I think it was maybe three or four years ago. Ms. Flowers had reached out. I was a mental health consultant with the Drew Judy Center. And Ms. Flowers had reached out and said that um, they were having some children with some um, some behavioral challenges. and. Um, as Kay mentioned, um, Ms. Flowers refused to keep sending them home and suspending them. So um, Ms. Flowers understood the importance of um, early mental health and um, working with the whole family and, and children may be displaying some of these behaviors because of um, things they may be going on at home or in the community. Um, we were able to, you know, and as I started working with Ms. Flowers, I was able to soon see the the love that she had for not only the children and families, but also her staff. Um, Ms. Flowers wanted to make sure that the staff was fully trained in early edu um, early childhood mental health. Um, so we were able to provide some trainings um, for the staff. Ms. Um, Flowers. We, we had the trainings on Saturdays and Ms. Flowers was paying for um, the breakfast and lunch out of her own pocket. So um, just really showed her dedication to um, the importance of early mental health and her dedication to the children. Um, we were able to connect again this school year. Um, Ms. Flowers again reached out and said that, that she had some children that needed some help. So we were able to um, in the midst of this pandemic, able to have um, a couple of our interns come in and um, provide some mental health services um, to to the children and families. And Ms. Um, Flowers would say, when I met with her in our office, she said, you know, if my staff is going to be here, my children is going to be here, I'm going to be here as well. So um, again, it just showed her dedication and love for, for all of her children, um, staff and families. So I, I, it was really my pleasure. Um, you don't really meet too many people that really have that, you know, that heart and love for children. So it was really my pleasure um, to get into to know Ms. Flowers and work with her. Thank you, Shanique. I know you're uh, there at the center with the staff. If anybody wants to say anything, they're welcome to. We want Jasmine and Ashley and all of Crystal's family and her staff, which we know she considered part of her family, to know that we are holding you in our hearts and minds and that we are excited to continue to be your partner. Oh, is that, there's Jasmine. Uh, can we, um, can we unmute where it says Little Flowers ECDC? Um, Andre, please. 
I've also put in the chat um, information about Crystal's uh, groundbreaking testimony at Congress and as well as um, some articles about her work in the Baltimore Sun. So I see that Little Flowers ECDC is unmuted. Oh. <laughs> she needs to try to help. <laughs> okay. 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 Oh, we got now we this one. Okay, we can hear Sorry you guys, we're having some technical difficulties over here. We totally understand. We can hear you now. Okay. Can everybody hear me now? We can. Okay, good. Um, so, hello, everyone. I am Jasmine Hardy, Miss um, Crystal's niece. Um, really, she was my mom because she raised me since I was five. So, she's really my mom. Um, I just want to say that I really appreciate you guys for honoring her and recognizing um, her commitment to um, the children here at Little Flowers and even in that Sandtown Winchester community. Um, I really, really appreciate you guys doing that. Um, I didn't know I was talking today, so I don't, <laughs> I don't That's okay. have like a speech or anything like that, but I just really wanted to say thank you to the University of Maryland for coming in and helping with our children, our staff. Um, you guys have been around for a very long time. Miss Kay, like you said, you've been knowing Miss Crystal for a very long time. Um, so I've always heard of you, even back before Little Flowers was even started. Um, so I really appreciate all the work that you guys have done for our staff and children. Um, and what I plan to do is carry on Ms. Crystal's legacy, um, keep Little Flowers open as it has been, um, continue the same things that she's done because she's instilled all of that in me. So that is my plan and my goal. Little Flowers isn't going anywhere. So I plan to see any of you guys that on this meeting, if I need any of you all, um, I hope you'll be there for me. Um, I'm here um, to keep the little flowers going. So thank you all for your help and thank you guys. Thank you, Jasmine, just as brave as her aunt. And we are here for you for sure. Thank you. Well, thank you everybody for celebrating with us today. Thank you again, Dr. Paris. Thank you again, Jasmine, for sharing your mom's love with us and and we're there to um, and to continue her important work. So thank you everyone and thank you. Um, happy spring. Thank you everyone. <laughs> Have a good afternoon.